Rangi e tu, papa e te koto, te whare reiki o pau tato te where where, pai mariri. Enga waka, enga mana, enga mau nga whakahi o te matu, tēnā koutou katoa. E rā ranga te rama, ko tai mai nei i tēnei ahi ahi pou, tēnā koutou, hurina nau mai hara mai rā koutou katoa. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening uh, to this professorial lecture uh, to be given by Professor Valmain Toki. Professor Valmain Toki is of Ngati Rehua, Ngati Wai, and Ngapui descent. Valmain holds a BA, LLB honours, MBA, LLM, and PhD has a current practising certificate as a barrister and solicitor of the High Court of New Zealand. She's listed in cases uh, to the Māori Land Court, the Environment Court uh, and the High Court. As a Heturi Pumao scholar, Valmain worked at Te Ohu Kaimoana, uh, where she completed her MBA. Valmain joined Te Peringa after five years lecturing at the Auckland Law School. She's the first Māori and New Zealander to be appointed by the President of the Human Rights Council to the UN's expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples. Through this, she hopes to raise the platform of Indigenous peoples and provide an opportunity uh, to promote their rights. This appointment builds on the previous two terms she served as an expert on the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Balmain's research, of course, and her writing and teaching lies within the area of Indigenous rights. She's published extensively in this area and provided global public lectures and seminars, including at Harvard Law School, on this topic. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for attending uh, this evening. And would you please welcome to the podium to give this evening's lecture, Professor Valmain Tolki. Valmain. E ho mā i ukuranga tēra tēnā koutou. Te whare e tū nei, te marae e takoto nei, e ngā iwi e tō nei, tēnā koutou. Ku hui hui mai nei i rungu te kaupapa o te pō, nō reira tēnā koutou. Ki ngā tangata whenua a tainui tēnei te mihi. Ki te whanua tuki, tēnei te mihi hoki. Engāri, kōa i au, ki te taho tōku māma, ko Aotea te mautiri rungu nui, ko Hiraka Matate maunga tapu, ko Moana nui a toi te Moana, ko Motairehe rau, ko Kaua ngā marae, ko ngā te rehua, ngā te wai te iwi, ko Valmain Toki a hau. Distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, friends, family and students, it's my privilege to deliver my professorial lecture this evening. I would firstly like to thank our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Neil Quigley, for this generous introduction, acknowledge Emeritus Margaret Wilson for her wisdom and guidance, uh, Professor Alison Kirkman for her belief, Professor Alpina Roy, um, my te peninga whānau, my iwi Māori whānau here at the university for their support, and of course my whānau, Steve, Kitty, Tamara and Taumata, and of course uh, our pēpi mahina. My professorial lecture tonight speaks to the challenges that Indigenous peoples face, which is quite serendipitous given that last week on August 9, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day, as we do every year, and this year the theme was on the role of Indigenous women in the preservation and transmission of traditional knowledge. By way of introduction, Indigenous peoples comprise about 6% of global population, some 476 million people across 90 countries located in every region. They include the poorest of the poor, the most marginalised, and account for 19% of the extreme poor. Although often the oldest inhabitants of nations, they are frequently stripped of their rights, particularly that fundamental right of self-determination, or tēnā rangatiratanga, and of course rights to land and rights to whenua, 
resulting in consequences for their well-being and the health of their communities. Despite data collected on Indigenous peoples globally, the definition of Indigenous remains quite contentious, particularly in Africa and Asia. So, uh, for example, to be Indigenous, do you have to be minority? Sometimes, but not always. Is it necessary to have that unique connection to land? Usually. Are you required to be subject to colonisation? Usually that is the case. To be Indigenous is often a combination of various criteria. In the absence of a culturally universally accepted definition of Indigenous peoples, varying definitions have emerged, such as the one on screen by Sha Zhang, he's the Under Secretary General for the Economic and Social Affairs. Jose Martinez Cobo, the Special Rapporteur on the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities, set out one of the most cited definitions of the term Indigenous in his seminal study of the problem of discrimination against Indigenous populations. The working definition on screen recognises key criteria such as an historical continuity, that Indigenous peoples often form that non-dominant non sector of communities, and yet determined to transmit and also preserve their identity according to their own, their own systems. And further defining that historical continuity component, we find that an Indigenous person is one who belongs to an Indigenous community through self-identification as Indigenous. So we're talking about group consciousness and is recognised and accepted by the community as one of its members, so acceptance by the group. Jose Martinez Cobo provided the intellectual framework through which notions of indigeneity should be understood, centering, this is important, centering the rights of Indigenous peoples themselves to define who is Indigenous. So what this does is that it preserves for Indigenous peoples that sovereign right and power to decide who belongs to them without that external interference often by the state. Despite this often cited definition, we are seeing more and more minority and community groups seeking to claim rights through that Indigenous rubric. And indeed, during the last session of the expert mechanism held in the UN in Geneva, we had local community groups providing interventions to that effect. Although UN agencies such as the World Bank defer to Indigenous peoples and local communities as a discrete classification of peoples they recognise, this implied conflation of Indigenous peoples and local communities, often referred to as spillage, is problematic. Subsequently, the three UN entities mandated within the area of Indigenous rights, so the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples will be holding expert seminars this year. The first is at the University of Arizona, and that's to examine and discuss the continuing development of, or slippage is a term that they use between minority rights, community rights, and the rights of Indigenous peoples. Now, perhaps if the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples had provided a definition of Indigenous, we may or may not be in this position. However, during the period leading up to the formulation of the Declaration, the Indigenous organisations developed a common position and actually rejected the idea of a formal definition of Indigenous peoples that would be adopted by the states. Similarly, on the other side, the governmental delegations expressed the view that it was neither desirable nor necessary to elaborate a universal definition of Indigenous peoples. And at its 15th session in 1997, the working group concluded that a definition of Indigenous peoples at that global level was not possible at that time and certainly, certainly not necessary for the eventual adoption of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This leads us nicely on to the Declaration. As mentioned, the Declaration was the initiative of the Working Group, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations. This group was established in 1982 with the mandate to develop international standards concerning Indigenous peoples' rights. The Declaration was a clear manifestation of this mandate and an articulation of international standards on the rights of Indigenous peoples. <clears throat> 
But it was not until some 25 years later, in September 2007, that the final text was adapted, adopted sorry, by the General Assembly. With a majority of 144 states in favour, there were 11 abstentions at the time, and the four states we all know actually opposed adoption, so uh, Australia, Canada, the United States, and us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. To further unpack the relevance of the declaration, I think it's necessary to understand why these four states voted against the declaration and then, then eventually changed their position. Australia, Australia was the first to reverse its position and officially endorse the declaration on the 3rd of April 2009, so about the same time as the Rudd Apology. Official endorsement requires a clear, unequivocal statement which preferably takes place on the floor of the General Assembly. Applying the standard questions the nature of Australia's endorsement, and why? Why? Because the statement made by Jenny Macklin was not delivered in the General Assembly, but in Parliament House. And additionally, it was not delivered on the floor of the House of uh, Parliament, so correspondingly there's no recognition in Hansard. A closer examination of the wording of his statement reveals ambivalence. So rather than announce that Australia endorses a declaration, Macklin noted that Australia changes its position and gives its support for the declaration. For academics, including Rothwell, uh, these features of Australia's endorsement cast serious doubts of whether any legal effect will arise. So it's subsequently, it's unsurprising that academics assert that in light of, of these facts, the High Court of Australia would not hold the statement as legally binding. Following a, Australia's announcement of support, uh, we uh, followed up on the 20th of April 2010, approximately a year later, with Minister Sharples from the General Assembly in New York during the ninth session of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and the, the then Honourable Minister Simon Power from Parliament in Wellington announced that New Zealand would be reversing its position and officially endorsing the declaration. Unlike Australia, this announcement was made in the General Assembly and in New Zealand's Parliament and subsequently noted in Hansard. However, the wording, the wording of the endorsement is parallel to Jenny Macklin's statement. In his address to the United Nations Permanent Forum, Minister Sharple stated, today, today New Zealand changes its position and we are pleased to express our support for the declaration. So like Australia, we did not say we reverse our position, nor that we endorse the declaration. So what this does is it raises questions on the intention of the statement and the nature of the endorsement. Minister Starples then identified a couple of areas, two areas where New Zealand held reservations. First of all, Article 26, the rights to lands, territories and resources, and Article 9, the right of free prior and informed consent. However, it's unclear whether states can place reservations or caveats on their endorsements, supporting some articles but re reversing or reserving um, support on others. It was the opinion of the government that these provisions were fundamentally incompatible with first, our constitutional and legal arrangements here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, secondly, the Treaty of Waitangi, and thirdly, the, governing, the principle of governing for the good, for the good of all our citizens. However, however, unlike ratifying an international treaty or covenant, it's unclear whether this selective endorsement is acceptable. Reservations to human rights treaties are contentious, particularly where the extent of that reservation undermines the goals of the treaty. To selectively endorse an aspirational human rights declaration contradicts the principles of indivisibility and interdependence of all human rights. This selective endorsement would appear to be the antithesis, right, of what a morally aspirational document such as a declaration seeks to achieve. Despite, despite concerns over what constitutes an official endorsement, the issue concerning the effect and role of the reservation or caveat New Zealand placed on the declaration is far more problematic. In his announcement to the United Nations Permanent Forum, Minister Sharp has qualified New Zealand's endorsement. I mean, I've got what he says on screen there. So this reservation or caveat provides that New Zealand's legal and constitutional frameworks will do what? Will define the bounds of New Zealand's engagement with the declaration. However, we know when we look 
at the text of the declaration, we think about Article 46.1, it's quite clear because it provides that nothing, nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as authorising or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair, totally or in part, the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. However, with that being said, earlier this year, Minister Jackson, the Minister for Māori Development, who is progressing our declaration plan, has completed the first stage. He recently stated that there is a lot of mahi across government underway that's consistent with the declaration, but having a plan, having a plan sets a roadmap, a roadmap of actions to steadily work towards and measure progress against. So circling back to uh, what Minister Sharples said in the permanent forum, is this the government controlling and defining the bounds of New Zealand's engagement with the aspirational elements of the declaration? Not to be left behind, on the 12th of November 2010, the Canadian government announced its support for the declaration. And one month later, on 16th of December 2010, the United States also lent support for the declaration. The terminology they employed does not include the term endorsement, but instead that of statements. Endorsements, of course, being the stronger, stronger language. Both refer to the declaration as being not legally binding and not, not a statement of current international law, or similarly, that it does not reflect customary international law, nor indeed change uh, the Canadian laws. Both refer to the aspirational nature of the declaration. The language of the statements employs terms such as reaffirming or continuing the state's commitment to Indigenous peoples. Similar to New Zealand and Australia, the support of the declaration comes with reservations and caveats um, on screen. And so on, on this analysis of support of the declaration elicited by these four countries, it's problematic because it compromises the rights contained within the Declaration, those fundamental rights. Nevertheless, perceived as a major triumph, the Declaration is the only international instrument that views indig Indigenous rights through an Indigenous lens and amalgamates Indigenous international rights within, within one document. Prior to the Declaration, Indigenous peoples had to creatively use existing international covenants and conventions, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and I'm thinking about Article 27, the right to culture there, and of course the Mahuika fishing case is uh, the one that we recognise most there. Turning uh, to consider the legal effect of the declaration, the declaration continues to have legal effect in different jurisdictions. And what this does is this highlights the importance of the role of politics and calls into question the legal effectiveness of the declaration. The orthodox view is that the declaration is soft law and will not be binding upon the states unless it's incorporated into domestic legislation. The doctrine of state sovereignty provides a restriction, a restriction on international instruments such as the declaration, and that's to regulate the matters within the realm of, of the state. Incorporation of the declaration into state law is the most effective and this has occurred in various jurisdictions, including most of our Latin American um, jurisdictions and Congo Brazzaville, where the recognition of indigenous rights are included within their respective constitutions. In Canada, we have uh, Bill C-15, which received royal assent last year in, on June 21st, which indicates ca Canada's positive steps to incorporating in indigenous rights. And here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as mentioned, we have a declaration plan although a little slow and not actually incorporated in any piece of um, legislation, I think is, um, is also positive. In the absence of this direct incorporation by statute, there are different methods of recognising international human rights instruments, including recourse through administrative law principles. First, we have um, mandatory relevant consideration in New Zealand has been employed to treat unincorporated international obligations as considerations for this decision maker. However, in this instance, it would necessitate extending that approach, right, from an unincorporated international obligation, such as a treaty, to an international moral obligation, such as a declaration. Notwithstanding that the Huakina Development Trust case noted that international obligations include both conventions and declarations such as the 
United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and given the robust nature of the debate and finalisation of the declaration, which took 25 years, together with the overwhelming majority of states who endorsed the declaration, 144, these matters collectively bode well. However, the factors, these factors are only persuasive, only persuasive on the courts and not binding. Another equally valid point is whether or not the use of a mandatory relevant consideration is simply a backdooring, a backdooring approach to incorporate the declaration, and it should be the purview of the legislature, not the judiciary, to incorporate international obligations such as these. Um, also, we have the presumption of, of consistency. What's this? It's a common law principle of statutory interpretation that recognises that Parliament is presumed not to legislate intentionally in breach of its obligations. But as New Zealand's now offered support for the declaration, this presumption may apply. However, like any presumption, it can be rebutted by the clear wording of a statute. When we think about uh, customary international law, uh, declarations can apply, can acquire a normative character and pursuant to Article 38J of the ICJ statute become customary international law and binding on states and we know that customary international law forms part of our common law. However, the test for finding customary international law must be met and that's of state practice and opinia juris or what states think. So the state's action must be intentional and then intention must manifest in action. If we find that New Zealand's action of endorsing the declaration satisfies that first limb and follow case law to relax, relax that second limb of state intention, then perhaps this, this is promising. According to Professor Jim Anaya, the declaration may be understood to embody or reflect to some extent customary international law. A norm of customary international law emerges or crystallises when a preponderance of states converge on a common understanding of the norm's content and expect future behaviour to conform to conform to that norm. However, even if this was accepted, New Zealand could rely on the initial vote against the declaration and claim that persistent objector status and thus immune from customary international law. Turning to a look at case law, the tribunal, the Waitangi Tribunal, recently reviewed the declaration as relevant, relevant to the manner in which the principles of the treaty should be observed by, court, by Crown officials. The approach to the declaration in Y2417 report was to use the declaration as a tool where possible. Why? Why to understand the Crown's obligation in specific circumstances to assist their assessment of the Crown's actions against the principles of the treaty. In addition, our Supreme Court bench is also referring to the declaration, so we think about the Takamori case and the Wakatu case, albeit obita, but nonetheless cited. And I always encourage my students to argue the declaration in submissions. Um, I say it may not be the strongest ground, but an additional layer to their submission to hopefully work towards that accepted norm. So although the orthodox view of the declaration is that it's not binding. We have a wealth of creative tools alongside that changing approach from our bench. And this in and of itself is a promising development when considering the legal effect of the declaration. Remembering, of course, the declaration doesn't create any new rights, but it's the only international instrument that views indigenous rights through an indigenous lens. The declaration simply affirms rights derived from human rights principles, such as equality, right, such as self-determination. The Declaration seeks to recognise Indigenous peoples' rights and contextualise those in, in, rights in light of the particular characteristics and circumstances and promotes measures to remedy the rights' historical systemic violation. The significance of the Declaration lies, its, lies in its effect. It provides a benchmark as an international standard against which Indigenous peoples may measure state action against. State breach of the standard provides Indigenous peoples with a means of appeal within that international arena. Recognised and supported by UN member states, this declaration contains norms that are already binding in international law. So the declaration provides this additional international instrument for Indigenous peoples when their rights, such as the right to participate fully in decision making, has been breached. Indigenous peoples can now argue that not only 
have international treaties been broken, but a breach of the right in the declaration ha has occurred. The available remedy, what's the remedy? I think it's a little bit uncertain. Nonetheless, it would be reasonable, reasonable to conclude that this would provide an avenue to engender effective dialogue between the state and indigenous peoples. And to further explore this, this, possibility, this possible relationship, I wanted to um, quickly turn to consider how UN vehicles can assist the recognition of indigenous rights with a couple of examples or uh, case studies. Uh, first, during my time on the Permanent Forum, I met with the Pacific Caucus to hear their concerns. The commonly held issue was that of self-determination, right, the key, right, Article 3, right within the Declaration. So I penned a study on decolonisation of the Pacific with an extract on the screen. Remembering, of course, there is a decolonisation process within the UN where a committee considers applications from entities inscribed on the non-self-governing territories list for a decolonisation uh, process to take place. Um, and indeed, during the last session of the expert mechanism, there was a lot of lobbying to the mechanism to have uh, this component of the UN process uh, realised through a proposal to the Human Rights Council. New Zealand recently agreed to enter into a decolonisation process with Tukalo, who is on the list of non-self-governing territories. And during the last decolonisation session in Geneva last month, New Zealand noted that it is undisputed that colonisation has been detrimental to Pacific Island nations, that Indigenous peoples have a right to self-determination, and that decolonisation of the Pacific is problematic. The third international decade for the eradication of colonialism, notwithstanding, there remain Pacific Islands seeking independence from their colonisers. I'm hopeful that there will be more progress in that space, uh, but as I mentioned, that uh, intervention only occurred last month from, from the New Zealand mission in Geneva. So my, my study that I penned, I included West Papua, Hawaii and French Polynesia, and as you can imagine, this wasn't popular with um, some of the state members, and they actually sought to hold up the report through, through the UN process. Uh, in this instance, I was fortunate to have the support from the NZ Mission in New York, who with the addition, additional support of friendly states managed to avert, avert a veto through the UN Economic and Social Council, and thankfully the report regressed it and was tabled. Otherwise, uh, my colleagues on the forum would have been really cranky with me. Uh, the second, the second uh, case study um, is for my recent um, expert mechanism session in Geneva. Uh, the statements are, are self-explanatory self and speak to an unacceptable behaviour by a state representative to an Indigenous woman, actually, uh, from Serbia. Um, and she's seeking asylum in Denmark due to the troubles um, from between the Ukraine and Russia war. So she's got asylum in Denmark. In Denmark. This, the first statement um, or intervention from the floor of the expert me mechanism continues to state that aggressive dialogue of the representative of the Russian state with Mrs. Yana Tanakashiva, including an attempt to find out her personal data as a pure fact of intimidation of indigenous rights defenders, considering our long negative practice in that field with Russian officials. Again, in a similar fashion, friendly states collectively made a statement uh, responding to, to this behavior, which, which happened more than once during the session. Um, and I've, I've got the collective statement made on screen. So, this is condemning the intimidation against indigenous peoples as occurred with a representative from the Russian Federation. Noting that everyone should have unhindered access with international bodies without fear, fear of reprisal. Reaffirming the role of the expert mechanism to provide advice to the Human Rights Council and to assist states to achieve the ends of the declaration. So both, both of those examples speak to the importance of state and indigenous peoples people's en engagement, and if I could just maybe go off script here a little bit and just mention something else that happened at, um, along the same lines uh, during the session, is that we were going to, the expert mechanism was going to dialogue with uh, 
with the Russian Federation and we uh, invited them to dialogue with us. They uh, came back and they said uh, they would speak to us but only in their mission across the road from the UN and those of you who have been to the UN in Geneva will know what I'm talking about and the, um, the, their mission has got like razor wire on the top and they have a guard outside with a, with a gun there and so we said no thank you, thank you but no thank you uh, because we were just being a little bit mindful that um, perhaps if we went in there it might be a little bit difficult um, to continue uh, finishing the session. So, But we did try to uh, meet with the Russian delegation to try and sort of um, explain to them that we didn't consider that behaviour as being acceptable and appropriate in that instance. Uh, before, before I conclude, um, just as an example of how UN processes assist Indigenous peoples, uh, one of my colleagues on the expert mechanism, Anexa Cunningham, she was actually prevented from boarding her confirmed flight to return home to Nicaragua following her participation in the 15th session of the expert mechanism. The airline had received an email from the government of Nicaragua stipulating that her entry into the Nicaraguan territory would be refused. Uh, this has resulted in an escalation, as you would imagine, to the President of the Human Rights Council, who has engaged in dialogue to enable Anexa to return home. Um, I think we'll be getting an update tomorrow, but as far as I am aware, she's actually still, still in Geneva. Uh, and also, the pressing issue, of course, is whether her safety can be guaranteed when she returns home. So during this very uh, short chat, um, I've endeavoured to take you for a walk or perhaps a sprint at times on a path to recognise Indigenous rights and, and highlight the myriad of challenges that exist from first minority groups and community groups seeking to claim under the rubric of Indigenous rights to secondly when an international instrument such as a declaration is finally adopted after 25 years of drafting, there are still states who offer reservations to what, to what is an aspirationally non-binding human rights instrument. To thirdly, as a declaration, the orthodox view is that it's non-binding unless incorporated into uh, the constitution, but we know there are creative tools uh, to ensure these fundamental rights are recognised, and I'm looking at um, our law students here, or our students in general when I'm saying that. And, and fourth, the UN system itself and the vehicles mandated specifically within the area of Indigenous rights and how political uh, platforms can seek to support but also undermine, undermine Indigenous voices. Uh, nonetheless, despite these challenges, Indigenous peoples are resilient, Indigenous peoples are survivors, and, and recalling, recalling, of course, that we do not necessarily need an instrument to tell us that our right of self-determination, that our right of tēnā ranga tērā tanga exists, or our right to our culture exists. These rights exist irrespectively of whether they're captured in an international document or not. Um, as a lawyer, we know that it's helpful if it is, but I always say to uh, my students, these rights exist irrespectively. They don't need to be captured into a document. We know ourselves. We exercise tēnā ranga tērā tanga at our home, and our schools, and our churches, and our community. Um, so uh, we don't need an instrument to tell us uh, that right that right exists. Kia ora koutou. Ena mana, ena reo, tine te peringa kia koto, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. Kia ora, thank you all very much for attending this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Professor Alpana Roy, Dean of Te Peringa Faculty of Law. It gives me um, enormous pleasure to both thank and congratulate Professor Balmain Toki, our newest professor in uh, Teparinga. As you, I'm sure you'd all agree with me, Balmain's lecture here tonight beautifully articulated the ongoing challenges for Indigenous rights worldwide. And of course, Valmain's uniquely qualified to speak on this issue, not only from her own personal standpoint, but from her decades of research and work in this field. 
She is an international authority in the field of Indigenous rights and her work has been widely regarded as a key contribution to the literature in the field. In addition, Valmain's work with the UN is truly remarkable. She uh, was the first Maori and the first New Zealander to be um, appointed as an expert member on the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And also earlier this year, um, Valmain was also appointed as a member from the Pacific on the UN's expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples by the UN's Human Rights Council. So this really is um, research impact and engagement at the very highest of international levels and um, really speaks to our strengths as a faculty in, in this university. Um, our faculty, Teperinga, turned 30 last year and we've been spending quite a bit of time celebrating this milestone and really re reflecting on our 30-year journey. And the faculty, as, as uh, Teparinga Fano will know, well know, faculty was founded on three core principles, biculturalism, legal contextualism, and professionalism. And you could really see all three of those core principles um, woven right throughout Balmain's lecture tonight and really dotted right throughout her brilliant career. Na mihinui Balmain, congratulations and thank you very much again on behalf of everyone in, in Teparinga. And I'll just go off, a little bit off script, and we were extremely proud when Valmain became a professor in 2020 because she was the only professor appointed right throughout the university. So again, kudos to you, uh, Val. This now concludes the formal part of uh, the evening. Thank you very much again for attending. We certainly hope we will see you again. Our next professorial lecture will be, will be that's, they're not for me, I know. Our next, uh, <laughs> our next um, professorial lecture will be on Tuesday the 13th um, of September. Professor Patrick Lehman, our Pro Vice-Chancellor in the Division of Arts, Law, Social Sciences and Psychology will be presenting. And um, Val Main, Val, if I could just um, invite you back and your whanau to the stage. Ko tēnei he mihi a poto, engari tēnā rā koutou katoa. Ko te Māori kei ronga, ko te Māori kei raro. Ko te Māori a tamanua te rā, ko te Māori o papatua nuku. Ko te Māori o e rā tipua, ko te Māori o e rā tawhito. Tīhei Māori o rā. Engari, um, ko au te tangata uh, nō te whānau nei, ko a whiwhi te mahi hei whakatakato he mihi ki a koe, mam. Um, <laughs> so... Ko koe, ko koe i whakata, i whakato i a hau, i whakato, i whakato uh, i, I, te, I te whānau nei hoki, tētahi kākano. Ko tētahi kākano, ka pū mai, ka whakatina na ai, um, ki tēnei mea hei takitaki, hei whakatina tina i a mātou, i te whānau nei hei whai tonu ai, ki a mātou wawata, ki a mātou hia hia, ki a mātou moi moi a. Ko tēnei uh, ki a hau, uh, ko tēnei he mea miharo, Ko tēnei he mea um, whakahirahira. Nā, um, ko tēnei te mihi ki a koe, mum. So. Ko oti? Ko oti? Ko oti? Ko oti?